I am with you always until the end of the world. I liked what we did two weeks ago here uh, when we said the Psalms together. I believe that when we prayed together, when we said the Word of God together, uh, there was an increased power in this room. And I would like to do the same thing here today as we say Psalm 91. May I ask you all to stand up again, please? And pray together with me. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. That was a tremendous promise from God. And while I'm not going to speak about this psalm in particular today, what I am going to speak about are about the promises of God. Promises that he makes to us, but very often we fail to realize we fail to understand and we fail to make true. The prophet Amos says, when you are on a journey with somebody, when you go for a walk with somebody, you have to be in agreement with that person. And if you're not in agreement, he will go one way and you will go the other way. And very often in our lives, we find that God says something and we say something else. We are not in agreement with him. He says you can do things and we say we can't do things. He says do not be afraid and we say but we are scared. He says all things are possible to you but we say no, nothing is possible to me. And when we are in disagreement with God, the things that he wants to do in our lives cannot be done. Today we're going to learn how to be in agreement with God so that all the promises that he makes in the Bible are fulfilled in our midst. I want to begin by asking everyone a question. And last week you were very honest. I hope you're honest this week too. How many of you woke up depressed this morning? Raise your hands. You were more honest last week. Last week more than half the hands went up here. 
How many of you woke up tired this morning? Raise your hands. How many of you woke up this morning thinking, my God, I am in a bad situation. I don't know if it is going to change. Raise your hands. And I want to tell you something. All those of you, in all honesty, raise your hands. There is a good chance that you prophesied the situation that you were in, are in today. That you brought it into being, not understanding that your word has power. Not understanding that everything you say, every word that comes out from your mouth, is moving things in a supernatural realm. And something, somewhere is making what you say happen, whether good or bad. The word has power. You might have heard sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. I tell you that is a lie. Words can hurt you even more than sticks and stones can because words have the power to cause immense damage both to yourself and to others around you. Where does this power come from? If you open the book of Genesis, you find it begins with words like this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw that it was good. Nine times he said things. Nine times things happened. And every time he saw that it was good. God didn't think the world into existence. He spoke the world into existence. He said and he saw it happen. Now we're not gods here and I don't want ever any of us to make the mistake of thinking that he is the power of a God. We're not gods. But we are the children of God. Made in his image and his likeness. And our words have power too. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Your words have power over life and death. But we don't realize that. So we say any silly thing we want to say, not understanding the consequences of the words we say. I remember a few years ago, well, not very long, but a few years ago nonetheless, people sometimes used to compliment me on their looks. On my looks and I used to look in the mirror and I never used to see anything good about me I used to see a man who was getting old I used to see a man who was getting fat and I used to see a man who was losing all his hair so I used to reply I don't know what you're talking about I'm fat I'm old and I'm balding and I said it as a joke but over a few months I realized that whatever I said was really coming true I was getting fatter and I was getting older and I was losing more and more of my hair. And then I said, this is stupid. So now what do I say? Now I say, hey, I'm gorgeous, man. And I'm getting younger all the time. <laughs> and I'm going to get all my hair back. Well, if Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead and a couple of other people, what do you think are a few hairs to him? What do you say? We have to have this positivity about us. Most of us, and in all truth, you understand this to be true, are negative people. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, this is too difficult for me. Oh, I failed in this so many times, it is impossible for me to do this again. Oh, I'm tired today. I don't have the energy to do anything within me. I don't have the energy to take another step. I'm telling you, you keep talking like that, you're going to drop dead one day. Before you take that step. Know what I'm saying? Well, somebody in my house is sick and he's really sick and, 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 and I'm afraid he's going to die. Well, he is going to die. All of you are. But if you keep talking like that, they might die sooner than they were supposed to die. Why? Because the words have power. Let us all understand that. I'm not going to give a long sermon today. But whatever little I say, I want you to take to your heart.
because from today I want to change the way you speak. Because every time you say something, understand you have the power to bless somebody or to curse somebody, to bless yourself or to curse yourself. And most of us spend our lives cursing ourselves. When you say nothing is happening in my life, nothing is working in my life, you are prophesying that nothing is going to happen in your life. How does it work? Let us imagine that you wake up in the morning feeling depressed. I mean, you are depressed. Should you lie? No, you say, I am fine, because what you're supposed to do is not describe the situation you're in, but describe what is going to happen. Why? Because you are something many of you don't realize, even though you're baptized as it. Every single Catholic, every single one of you who is baptized in Christ is baptized as three roles. Do you know what they are? Prophet, priest, and king. I ask you, once again, in all honesty, how many times have you ever felt like you were a king? How many other times did you ever feel that you were a priest? You don't have the same priesthood that a priest do, but you share in a common priesthood. And how many of you ever thought that you might be a prophet too? The words that you say have impact, especially upon your lives. This is who you are. Understand who you are. You are a prophet. And a prophet is a person who speaks the word of God out aloud. And he's a person when he speaks the word of God aloud, God sends his angels down to make it happen. Do you know this song, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart? It goes something like this. I don't sing very well, but I'm going to sing. Sorry, what did I do? I made a negative statement. I don't sing very well. When you say I don't sing very well, you're not going to sing at all. Instead, you say, I sing. God has given me a voice. And maybe I might not be able to sing like Tina Turner. I wouldn't want to sing like her anyway. But I can sing, so I'm going to do this. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong because of what the Lord has done for us give thanks yeah <laughs> <laughs> I sing well. What do you say? Amen. You sing well too. Now there were a couple of lines in that song that many of us have sung many times without understanding what it means. Just like many other beautiful songs we sing. We sing them like parrots. They sound good and we sing them, but behind every good song are good meanings. And behind this song, there are beautiful meanings. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak not say, I am weak. Let the weak not admit to their weakness. Let the weak not say, I cannot do anything. Let the weak say, I am strong. And when the weak says he is strong, God up in heaven says, there that man or woman has made a declaration in faith. And he sends his angels to fulfill it. It is the way it works in the supernatural realm. Because the words that we say are not just any words at all, but words that come from here. Words that have power. Words that have God's power behind them. Why? Because almost every single word in there is a promise from God. Your problems in your life. I know that. I doubt there is a single person sitting in this room today who doesn't have one problem in their life. 
Most of your multiple problems, you breathe them. And when you look at your problems, sometimes these problems look so huge. They look unsurmountable. They look impenetrable. They look like as if they cannot move out of your sight. They stand in front of your face like a huge mountain. And when you look at this mountain staring at you, you're overwhelmed by what you see, by what you face. And you sit on over there and you feel defeated. But what does Jesus say? One of my favorite scripture passages is Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, where he says, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and the mountain will move. Amen. Now listen to what he's saying here. You say to the mountain, now you think about how huge this mountain is. Not feel overwhelmed by the sight of this mountain in front of you. He doesn't even say, ask me for help. He's saying, you say to the mountain, move from here to there. And the mountain will move. Another place Jesus says, you tell the mountain to go and jump in the sea and the mountain will jump in the sea. We all have problems and what do we do? We talk about our problems. God is saying, don't talk about your problems. You only magnify them when you speak about how huge they are. He says, talk to your problems. And you say, you problem, get out of my way because you might be big, but I know somebody who's bigger than you and that is my God. Nothing is bigger than our God. Nothing. And that's the reason I love him so much. Because I understand that even though we might face obstacles along the way, even though we might face hurdles along the way, even though sometimes we have situations that are so immense and there seem to be no way to get through them, I know that our God is bigger than all these problems. So why worry? Talk to your problem. Talk to your problem and say, hey, you might think you're big, but you know what? You're actually nothing. Get out of my way. And the mountain will move. In the book of Zechariah, there was this man called Zerubbabel who was building a temple for God. And Zerubbabel also had a mountain in front of him. What do you think he did? Oh, you mighty mountain. You're going to become a plain in front of Zerubbabel. And guess what happened? Exactly what he said. You got somebody dying in your house today? Say they're going to be well. You got somebody who is sick in your house today? Say by Jesus' stripes he has been healed. You feel defeated today? You tell yourself in Jesus I am a conqueror. Whatever the situation you face, and we're going to look at some examples later on. You look at the word of God and you tell your problem. You might look big. You might act big, but you're really very, very small. And what do God's children say? Thank you, Brother Annie. Thank you. I have a small message to share with you. A testimony. Early morning, I woke up and I said, I'm too tired, it's six o'clock, let me go back to sleep. Then I thought to myself, no, I'm not tired. I'm getting out of bed and going to church. And I participated in the early morning mass and the message was that you will recognize the good shepherd from the fruits. And uh, today we, we see the fruits of HSI 
and I think we have a good shepherd. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus is the good shepherd. We just learned from him how to look after the flock that he's left behind and he takes care of the rest. There are a couple of things that brother said just now in his brief one minute testimony. Everything that happens here is inspired by the spirit. And he said two things. First he said, I'm tired. And if he continued with that belief that he was tired, what would he have done? He'd have gone back to sleep and his entire day would probably have been just filled with, I'm tired, I can't do anything. But he recognized the lie there. And instead of saying, I'm tired, what did he say? He said, I am not tired. And when he spoke that word, what happened? He went for mass. He received the Eucharist. He was blessed by the presence of God there. And I'm sure the rest of his day went beautifully. Tell us that it did. Yes. So let's put our hands together for the power of the word. <laughs> a word is good not only for our lives, but the lives of others too. And now I'm coming to a place where you're going to hurt. You're going to hurt because what I'm going to say next is going to really pierce you. And it's going to make you feel bad. Just like our words can build ourselves, our words can also build others or they can destroy others. And unfortunately for most of us, we've been given a tongue that we don't use to bless others, but we use to curse others. Beginning, strangely enough, with our spouses and our children. Now all you men sitting in this room, when is the last time you told your wife she was beautiful? Don't answer. Really, really. There you go. He doesn't remember. We are so used to putting people down. And we do it very often without realizing it. And we tell our wife she's useless and she's worthless and she cooks badly and she's not there to do anything good at all. And, and day after day after day, all we're doing is putting somebody down, not understanding that what we're actually doing is cursing them. What about our children? When's the last time you said a good, encouraging word to them and said, you're a wonderful child, you're going to do great things when you grow up? More often than not, it is you're a useless guy and you're going to end up washing dishes in some hotel. <laughs> right? I know you know what I'm saying. I know you know what I'm saying. With our mouth we destroy. And sometimes you might not see the destruction in front of you. But it happens. When the Jesus was in Bethany and he was feeling hungry. And he saw a fig tree in the distance. And he went to this fig tree hoping to find fruit on it. But when he didn't he got angry and he cursed the fig tree. The apostles were around him and they didn't see any change in the fig tree. But the next morning when they went to that side, they saw the fig tree had shriveled. The word of God that had left his mouth had started working on the inside. And inside the tree died the moment he spoke the words. It took a little while later for what was inside to be expressed on the outside. And I'm telling you here, no I'm not telling you, I'm warning you here. The words that you say to people around you are like words that will destroy them on the inside. Every harsh word, every cruel word, every bitter word, every mean word, every word that puts somebody else down. We're experts at that. Experts at that. Even in the church. Even in the church. Leaders of groups who should have a Christian heart, who have the Holy Spirit working powerfully in them. All they can do is gossip and slander and put somebody down. We've made it a habit because we've got so used to doing it. It doesn't even register to us anymore of the damage that we do by the words that we say. Think about it. Think about your lives. And think about the last time you really encouraged somebody in your life. 
went to her brother and said, you're a fantastic man. You're going to be a blessing to a lot of people. Go to your daughter. Maybe she's playing the organ and she's making a few mistakes. And instead of saying, at the rate you're playing, you're never going to play, that is really good. You're going to become a good piano player one day. Or your husband is struggling without a job. And instead of going to him and nagging him about not having a job, take courage. There is a good job on your way and I know there is a good job coming your way. And it's going to be a real blessing to you and to all of us. Your words have power. And even if it doesn't serve any other purpose, it will lift up the hearts of these people who are down and depressed. Are you listening to me here today? We need to be blessings to people. And the blessings we can be to people are through the words that we say. And some of us here are in positions of authority. And when you're in a position of authority, it is because Jesus has put you high over other people. Whether you're a priest, whether you're a president, whether you're some leader of some group, whether you're a teacher, an educationist, whenever you have people under you, understand that you have the power to damage them or to bless them. So the next time your students come up in front of you, don't tell them they're worthless and not going to amount to anything. Don't put dunce caps on their heads and put them out of the school. Tell them how good they are. Tell them how wonderful they are. Tell them how great they're going to be. And see how they change. See how the people around you change. People come to me for counseling. And they come to me with all kinds of problems. And I tell everybody, you will leave here better. Why? Because I know just the words have power. I'm speaking positivity. I'm speaking life to them. And they leave better. Ask anyone, how many of you have come to my house? And haven't you left better? Yes. There is healing there. Because I'm a magician? No. Because God has blessed me with special gifts? No. Because I have a tongue that speaks words of life. Understand that. How does healing take place? How does deliverance take place? How do miracles take place? Because you believe in this word and you say the word and that's all it needs to say it. You come to me and you say you don't have money. What do I tell you? Oh, I'm really sorry about that. You know, you don't have money. I can't help you. I don't know what to do. I don't have money either. That's what we do. You tell them, no, you will have the money that you need. And you tell them a good story about a time in your life when you didn't have money and God gave it to you. I have a favorite story. Uh, can I share it? Most of you have heard this before, but it's a story worth, worth sharing and it might inspire some people here who are struggling with money now. All of you by now know that I was in jail. All of you know that's when I found Jesus. All of you know that God has worked powerfully in my life since then. But what happened after I came out from jail was that I was broke. No, actually I was broke when I went to jail. When I came out from jail, I was broker, right? <laughs> and there were bills to be paid. Now my wife had a good job, but most of her money was tied up in loans and mortgages. And all she used to do was get home 2,000 dirhams a month. In addition to this, we were about 40,000 dirhams in debt. Understand the situation. You have a mountain here. 40,000 dirhams in debt, no jobs, only 2,000 dirhams coming in a month. What are we going to do? I thank God that I found him at that time because he told me not to worry. But then that's easier said than done, you know? I had bills to be paid and one of the bills I had to pay was to my landlord. As you all know, we give him four checks a month here and there were uh, four checks due. And one of my checks was due on the 1st of January and I didn't have enough money to pay it. 
Now, as you all know, if you bounce a check in Dubai, they put you in jail. And I just come out from jail. I had no particular desire to go back inside. Right? So I was very worried. But I have a lot of new faith. And I go to my God. I remember there were seven days before the check was due. And I told him, Father, I, uh, I have this check that is due. And I don't have money to cover this. And I heard him say, be still. And I said, be still. You're going to take care of it? And he said, yeah, I will take care of it. Be still. So I was still for all of 24 hours and I started getting fidgety again. You know, the six days due for the check to be cleared and there's no sign of any money from anywhere. So I go back to my prayer room. I need to remind God in case he's forgotten. See? And again, he says, I will take care of it. Be still. So I was still again, again for all of 24 hours. And then my nerve broke and I said, hey, you know, this is not working out. This is all my imagination. I went to a friend, borrowed some money from him, put it in the bank and the check cleared. And I can hear God say to me, Anil, I told you to be still. Okay, Lord, next time, next time I'll be still. Next time I won't do anything. Hoping that within three months, all my financial situation will be taken care of. Nothing of that sort happens. Three months later, it's the same story. There is a check due. There are not enough funds in the account. And the same countdown begins. I go to my prayer room and God tells me the same thing. Be still. So I'm still. Seven days. Six days. Five days. Four days. God, I'm here. I don't think so, Lord. I go to a friend, borrow some money, put it in the bank. You know what I'm talking about, guys, don't you? And then I hear God say to me again, Anil, I told you to be still. When are you going to learn to trust me? And then I say, okay, Lord. This time, this time I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to borrow money. I'm not going to do anything. If I have to go to jail, I'll go to jail and I'll evangelize the prisoners there, but I'm not going to do anything. Hoping still in my heart it won't come to this. But with God, there's no fooling around. Three months later, it was the same story. Check two, not enough funds and the countdown begins. But this time I'm determined not to move. Seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. <laughs> Nothing. Nada. Zippo. Zilch. The next morning, one hour before the banks are to open, there is a man standing at my doorstep with exactly the amount of money I need to cover my rent. What should the people of God say? <laughs> I had lent him this money about three years ago and suddenly that morning he was inspired to return it to me. The mountain was huge. We trust God. Tell the mountain to move and the mountain will move. I know there is fear. I know there is anxiety. But the word of God says, do not be anxious about anything, but come to me. Tell me what you need. Thank me and then go away in peace, the word of God. Tell me what mountain is bigger than the word of God. There isn't anything. And this is what I want us to remember here today and to speak the word positively in everything that you do. And when you speak to other people, understand the power that this mouth has and bless them. Bless people around you. Tell people how wonderful they are. Tell people how good they are. Tell people how great they're going to be and see how their lives and your change. Jesus was an expert in telling people good things about themselves. He was an expert in blessing people. He had 12 men that he handpicked to be his apostles. And what a motley bunch of people they were. One guy was a coward. Another guy had a hot temper. They were mostly all illiterate, ignorant people. They were people you passed by in the street and you wouldn't give them a second glance. What did Jesus say to them? He didn't say, you are a stupid fisherman. You're never going to become anything in your lives. He said to them, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And see what they became because of the blessing that he pronounced on them.
to be like that. You guys need to pronounce blessings on yourselves. Pronounce blessings on your families. Pronounce blessings on your colleagues at work. Pronounce blessings on your neighbors. And you will see everybody's life change. Now this is one exercise I want all of you to do here today. When you go home, I want you to go to your wife. If she's here with you, you're going to tell her on the way out. You're going to tell her you're beautiful. You're going to tell her how much you value her and what a fantastic woman you think she is. You're going to tell her how great she makes you feel when you're in the middle of friends. You're going to tell her wonderful things about herself and you will see her face glow. But more than that, you will see in a few days or a few weeks, she beginning to change and becoming the words that you pronounced on her. You will go to your husbands and you will not say you useless drunkard. <laughs> no, no, we don't drink here. We're at your side. We're good people. <laughs> you will say you're a good man and I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm not your wife, Jihad. <laughs> your wife got to say this to you, all right, man? <laughs> What about people who don't have husbands? I'm coming to you in a minute. <laughs> All right, there are a couple of ladies here looking for husbands. If you need a wife, then let me know, okay, afterwards. Uh, <laughs> or, or the next week, you just come and sit in front. All the singles come and sit in the front, okay? <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that reminds me, these, these women, some of these women, not all these women, I'm sure they'll wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm again getting up next to nobody. You know, <laughs> they're having a good time. You know, I go to sleep alone and I wake up alone and I eat my breakfast alone and I go shopping alone. The shopping might be good to do alone. <laughs> I am <laughs> doing things alone and, you know, if you're negative, you say, oh, Lord, I'm never going to get married. Um, I'm never going to have this man on a, on a shining horse come and get me. But if you are listening to what I've been saying today, if you have been paying attention to what I've been saying today, you are going to wake up every morning and say, I am waiting for the right man whom God is going to send my way. He's going to be tall, he's going to be dark, and he's going to be handsome. And he's going to be rich. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> so, that's what you're going to do. You're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to say, I believe. Yes, all right. From tonight itself. Okay, don't waste time. From from tonight itself. All right, all the single people in this room say, Lord, I believe. All the single people, you're married. <laughs> Lord, I believe that you got the right person waiting for me. And he or she is going to come soon. And they're going to be gorgeous. All right, that's easier to just say hallelujah. All right, okay. Let's give them a big hand, please. <laughs> so uh, get, let's get back to our homework. Go home today and go and see your son and your daughter. Go into their room. doesn't matter what they might be doing. Give them a tight hug and tell them how great you think they are. And tell them how much you believe that they're going to do marvelous things in the years to come. And then every day, when your wife or your husband is leaving the house, or your son or daughter is leaving the house, you're going to go, you're going to give them a hug again, you're going to pat them on the back, and you're going to give them a blessing. Sometimes I sit in St. Mary's Church, St. Mary's is closer for me, even though this church is very dear to me. And I see a Filipino family, there are about 12 of them who come, and they sit down over there, and after the Mass, 
the mother and the father will put their hands on all the children. Now this is a huge family. And they're making quite a scene in the church. But I, it touches my heart. It touches my heart to see the blessings that they bestow upon their children. And I'm telling you, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure of this. Each and every one of those children is going to be something great someday. Now you can do the same thing to your children. And you need to do it. You need to do it not just tonight, but every night before they go to sleep. They're not so old that you cannot spend a few minutes sitting by their bedside. Sometimes my wife is sleeping and I'll be lying next to her and I just put my hand on her and I thank God for the wonderful wife that he gave me. And I bless her. Do these things even when the other person is not aware that you're doing them. But it's important that you do them when they are aware that you're doing them. Because all too often, often we have things in our heart that we leave unsaid. Don't leave it for the last moment when you're in your dying bed. You might not get the chance to say the things that you want to say, the things you should say. Now, before we leave here, I want to finish a little early today. I wanted to finish a little early, but once I'm given a mic, I just go on and on. Thank you. I want to bless you. I want to bless you here, all of you with good health. I want to bless you as my role as a shepherd of this flock. I want to bless you with prosperity. I want to bless your families with wondrous things, with all the beautiful things that God wants to give you. I want to bless you in your jobs. I want to make sure, I want to bless you with good jobs that you're happy with. I want to bless you with good friends, friends who will treasure you for the person you are. I want to bless you with everything that is good here. And I believe that God is fulfilling this blessing even as I make it. And all the children of God say, Amen. Now before I go, there's one more thing I want you to read. These are words that you're never going to say again. Words like, I can't. Or words like, I'm afraid. So I want all of you to listen to these words. And the Bible is full of words that combat anything the devil might fill your head with. Whenever you feel negative about something, you don't be negative, you be positive. And see the transformation in your lives. Do we have it up? <clears throat> Can we all stand? Never again will I say I can't. Are we all there on the page? How many of you say I can't? You're never going to say I can't again for the rest of your life. We have the first one here. Never again together. Never again will I say I can't because I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Never again will I say I don't have because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches. Never again will I say I am afraid because God has not given me the spirit of cowardice but a spirit of power. Never again will I say I lack faith because God has given to every man a measure of faith. Never again will I say I am weak because the Lord is the strength of my life. Never again will I say Satan is powerful because greater is the God who is in me than the evil that is in the world. Never again will I say I am defeated because we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Never again will I say I lack wisdom because Christ has become for us the wisdom of God. Never again will I say I am sick because through his stripes we are healed. Never again will I say I am burdened because I can cast all my burdens upon Jesus who cares for me. Never again will I say I am in bondage because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And never again will I say I am condemned because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's put our hands together for our Lord. <laughs> That's for you, Lord.